I met Marshall first at the christening of the library wing of, of uh, the director of the Pasadena Playhouse School of the Theater down in Pasadena. And her name was Mrs. Fairfax Proudfit Walkup. Uh, so, uh, as a common, she took champagne bottle and stashed it across, uh, uh, across the uh, wing of the house. Nothing happened. Tried it a second time. Nothing happened. And, of course, the third time it shattered. And I just happened to look uh, across uh, the lawn, and I saw this tall man, little mustache, chawing on a uh, a pipe, uh, look, looking, oh, ever so superior, with white ice cream pants, as we used to call them in the South, and his uh, roaring blazer, which was white flannel with a black uh, border, and standing there looking so superior to everybody. I had met his mother previously. She was interested in dramatics and the theater and had done quite a, uh, a great deal in the uh, theater. One woman uh, evenings, readings, and uh, she had told me she wanted me to meet her handsome son who would be there at, on the, that occasion. So she brought him over and we met and it, she had taken a little house there in Pasadena in order to be with him because uh, he'd been away at Cambridge and she hadn't seen him at some time. So she'd have me over for weekends and, and it was very delightful. And we climbed, climbed mountains, if you can imagine mountains around Pasadena together and strolled down the gardenia scented streets. Uh, didn't have a chance. I mean, romance, wow. Uh, and uh, spouty poetry off to each other. So that's how I met the man. He was at, uh, I had come down to the Huntington Library to do some work on his PhD thesis uh, when our paths crossed. So had he won your heart right from the beginning? Well, that's overstatement. <laughs> Uh, let's say he piqued my curiosity. He was an uh, intellectual. I recognized that at once. Uh, the boys, men, at home uh, were stodgy businessmen or cowboys, certainly not intellectuals. And he was the first uh, a real intellectual I'd ever met and, and sort of... Uh, uh, a completion in that way. For yourself? At, yes. At home, if you read a book, and I read omnivorously, you had to hide it. Why? Or you, were called, you were considered a blue stocking. And uh, Fort Worth was a very social place. Uh, lots of dances, lots of dates. Uh, and the girls uh, just were not um, interested in in reading, in studies. Uh, so anyway, oh, in, it was great for me to really re, uh, meet an intellectual. Can you talk a little of, uh, of Professor McLuhan's mother? I wonder what influence uh, you think she may have had on Professor McLuhan. I, th I think she had every influence. And from an early age, Marshall has told me that from an early age she uh, talked about England. I don't, I, she'd never been there, I believe, but she uh, stimulated him to, to think about English, uh, I suppose, writers, and certainly his great desire to stu study at Cambridge. Now, he went to Cambridge after he already had a B.A. and M.A. from Manitoba. And he felt that a B.A. from Cambridge would be far superior to an M.A. Manitoba. And that was all uh, due to his mother, really. 
she was a very ambitious woman, uh, frustrated because there really wasn't much of an outlet, a big outlet. And her one-woman theater sort of thing, she, she didn't have an agent. I don't know if they had agents in those days, but uh, were church groups, high, uh, schools, colleges, you know. And she certainly deserved a much wider audience, a different kind of audience. But she thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, we were in Eurythmics class together. We did fencing together and up on the roof of the Playhouse and uh, were in plays together there. But I, I got to know her fairly well. and She had never met a Southern gal, and so she was intrigued. And I'd never met a Canadian person. Uh, eh, I thought they were a little strange. They weren't like Southerners. <laughs> Was, do you think he got his love of language from his mother? No, I think it was something that was just within him. Yeah, he was certainly encouraged in, in everything by his mother. His father was not a, a literary man, perfectly charming, gallant uh, person, but he wasn't a literary person, so he couldn't have gotten it there. He was a very handsome man. Uh, roughly six foot two. What influence do you think his father had on him? I find that very hard to say. His brother, his younger brother, Marshalls, was closer to the father uh, because by temperament they were more alike. And Marshall was much more like his mother, high strung and very, very bright. And his mother, back to his mother, I've often said, was the most intelligent woman I've ever met and most frustrated because there was no outlet for her considerable talents. But she was so bright. I understand that you, uh, the two of you eloped. Is that right? I was in Austin, Texas that summer. Uh, they were revising the curriculum of the Fort Worth Public Schools and another... Girl, woman and I were doing the speech department and Marshall came down to visit me. Uh, he was teaching in St. Louis at the time so instead of going straight home I decided to go to St. Louis you know sort of like this for what being there uh, and uh, have a couple of days there I've omitted some things there. I have a couple of days there and then go on home because I had only enough money. I hadn't been paid for the summer job. Only enough money to spend two nights in, Fort, in uh, St. Louis. So I booked into a hotel. And uh, meanwhile, there was a cousin of my mother's who was had been visiting in Fort Worth and was sent immediately back to St. Louis when they learned, when the family learned where I was there, to get me out of the clutches of this wicked man. So, I ended up uh, spending uh, a week or ten days with Cousin Mabel and getting married. I mean, Marshall had said to me uh, that he was going to, uh, he was going to Cambridge regardless, of what, but he wanted me to go with him. This was in, in uh, 1939, and he was sure there wasn't going to be any war. Well, I learned later he hadn't looked at the newspapers or, or listened to any of the broadcasts. And I said, of course, we'll correspond. You know, that's the end of it. Well, I'd, I'd never had uh, a, a boy propose an ultimatum. I thought, well, <laughs> I've got to think this thing over. Well, I did overnight, and we hadn't even we hadn't bought a wedding ring. Uh, he wanted to sail immediately. I didn't have a passport. Uh, I had taken instructions in Catholic uh, religion when I was in Austin. He had come down for two or three days to see me there, but I'd done it as a lark just to see what it was all about. But so we hurried out the next morning bought a wedding ring uh, and went to the consulate and uh, 
started the proceedings for a, a passport. And we got married in the chapel uh, in the parish house of, of St. Louis Cathedral. The two people who witnessed were his old-time friend, Bernie Mullatime, uh, who had been a student at the Pontifical Institute of Medieval Studies here and was accorded, uh, uh, was accepted. Uh, uh, Etienne Gilson was the head of the, the institute at that time and was acknowledged to be the brightest student he'd ever had. But he was quite a character aside from that. So he was stood up for Marshall and my cousin Mabel uh, insisted she had to be present. And the whole time she said, oh, the family will never forgive me. The family will never forgive me. <laughs> but we got married and uh, had a night together. And then I went home to pack. Uh, my family, more or less, state of nervous breakdowns. <laughs> and then Marshall came down and picked me up, went out to New York. It's not that simple, really, but went out to New York. And the passport met us at the boat. Everything was split seconds, and off we went. He was an intensely religious person. He didn't impose it on other people. I often said that the marshal's priorities, from the beginning, first his faith, his Catholic faith. And incidentally, he said he read his way into the church by way of G.K. Chesterton. He had been, I think, United Church. Oh, okay, his, uh, uh, his first priority was his uh, religion. His second priority was... Uh, his intellectual life, which he couldn't help. It was, it was he, day and night. And then I often said that I ran a third place in the race. But the other two, uh, his religion was part of his being. And the intellectual, it was part of his motivation. Uh, he just couldn't help it. He'd get up in the middle of the night. He'd have an insight and work on it. Or he'd come down early in the morning. Uh, he had uh, the New Testament in every place we'd go in Europe. Uh, he'd get a testament of the country. He had New Testament in Spanish, in Italian, in French, of course, in German, you name it. And he'd bring one or two texts down with him with the English to, uh, and read the same passage uh, to perfect his his uh, grasp of foreign language. Marshall was primarily a teacher, a professor, if you will. Uh, and he loved the, the meetings of mine. He didn't get up and, and pontificate, as many professors did. Uh, those who used the same material over year after year after year. <clears throat> But Marsha wanted to get the the students' participation, and they responded, my goodness, very, very eagerly, and he'd respond to their response. It, it, all of his classes were meetings of minds, and okay, if they got out off the subject, but it didn't matter. They were still learning. He was uh, dimly regarded by his fellow fellow academics. And uh, it even came to our attention at one time that uh, he was being, the students were being discouraged from taking his courses. And that was particularly true uh, when he had the coach house, the Center for Communication. Uh, uh, they would discourage students by saying, you don't want to take that. They just talk. You won't learn anything. And several of the students insisted on taking the course there and told Marshall about it. But, you know, a lot of professors just didn't have one idea. Uh, from one year to the next, didn't have a new idea. And they couldn't understand all these new and, uh, and somehow uh, they were upsetting ideas were being allowed. 
Oh, yes, Marshall loved teaching. And the, st the students loved being in his classes. When Marshall uh, uh, learned of criticisms from his students uh, of other professors uh, or of, uh, of the university uh, about his method of teaching, as he used to say, it just rolled off his shoulders like a duck. <laughs> uh, it didn't bother him because uh, he had as much scorn uh, of their methods, the cut and dried, no ideas methods as they had of his. And uh, their criticism really was based on the fact of intellectual lethargy. They'd gotten in a rut, and the rut was awfully comfortable. Uh, and envy that he was so popular and that he was getting so many new ideas, which uh, in, in Marshall's day, as you probably know, uh, his ideas were so far advanced that only now are some of them coming to be accepted. But it didn't bother him, and he he never uh, he never thought that he was producing a lot of things of new things. It was just the ideas that kept flowing in his mind, and he couldn't stop them any more than you could stop drinking a glass of scotch, which incidentally I hate, <laughs> but he liked. Uh, I think uh, most people never th considered that Marshall was a modest man. And uh, one reason being that he wouldn't stop and patiently uh, explain ideas. If he were asked, of course, he'd give an explanation. But he'd always go to something new. And when, at one point, I pointed out to him, why don't you stop and explain it? takes too much time. I've got to get on to new ideas. Let somebody else explain it. They can write a book explaining it. But I've got to get on something new. I have been asked uh, at a number, on a number of occasions which was Marshall's favorite book. And that's very difficult to answer. I know which was his least favorite. Uh... But, uh, oh, his least favorite was the one he did with Barry Nabbit. Take Today, the executive dropout. Take Today, because it didn't quite accomplish what he wanted it to accomplish. And he, he felt that it was, it was too trivial in a way. But it has been widely accepted, and, and readers have liked it, so... I think the book he was proudest of was probably The Gutenberg Galaxy. It was so beautifully set up, and he was so tremendously interested in the material, and the material was so basic. I think, and of course, Understanding Media is a very good reference book. It covered practically everything. Uh... But he moved beyond that. I have been told that Marshall was just getting into his best work by the time he died. Laws of the Media uh, volume was only half finished. And I tried to help him by reading some of it. Remember, he couldn't read or speak or write at that point after his major stroke. But I couldn't do the things, and I couldn't understand what he wanted me to do. So it, it lay fallow for some time, and then finally uh, he indicated to me that he wanted Eric to finish it. Now, Eric had worked with his father <laughs> since he was in the teens, when his father would wake him up at night. And he was conversing with his father's ideas, their minds ran parallel, 
But Eric's type of thinking was different from his father's, but their minds were parallel. Nobody else could have finished it. So it's a different, a bit of a different book from the kind it would have been when, if Marshall had finished it himself. Uh, in a way, I think it's a better book, but I can't really judge. It just occurred to me that one point that might be interesting to you all uh, is about understanding media and when it was published. I don't think I touched on this. Uh, Marshall was in Vancouver, I believe, at a conference that was built around his work uh, when the proofs were sent uh, to me, to Marshall. Now, I did all of Marshall's typing, uh, editing, and proofreading because once he had written a thing, he didn't want anything to do with it. You couldn't get him to read it again. So uh, I'd very carefully uh, paginated at the top, each page, you know, in sequence. When it was returned to me, the whole thing was out of out of sequence. And the, the poor typesetter uh, would put... Uh, uh, insufficient material, uh, material missing, incoherent. So I, I readily discovered what the matter was. It was that the, the material had obviously been dropped and the editor had just picked it up and put it back together again and shipped it off to me. So I did something that you're not supposed to do. I got the master copy down and scissors and paste and page by page, about two-thirds of the way through, I'd cut and insert as it was supposed to be. And it was very laborious and I knew they wouldn't approve of that. So I phoned the editor and I said, look, this is what's happened. Uh, somebody's dropped it uh, and hasn't put it back together again properly. And I said, if you'll pay... My expenses, I'll come and work with you. He said, no, I guess I'll have to read the damn thing. And it was also uh, reported to us that he said, he turned around and said to somebody, that's the first existential uh, bit of work I've ever had to edit. And, of course, he took a very dim view of it, and then it, it turned out to be one of their lasting books. But it's very funny, you know, about his uh, dropping it and not even taking the, making the effort to put it back in sequence. Uh, one reason I think that people found Marshall's work hard to understand, one reason was a built-in antagonism to them. And uh, the second reason was their inability or reluctance to think things out. You couldn't put, pick up a book and just go through it as you would uh, a whodunit. And, and uh, actually, his works weren't hard if you approach them with more or less open mind. Uh, I have the example of our youngest son, uh, who was, uh, oh, I, I suppose he was maybe in high school, or maybe he was in grammar school at the time. He wouldn't ask his father to see one, a copy of Understanding Media. He went out and he saved his money. He went out and bought a copy. He had no difficulty. And friends of his had no difficulty. They, di they didn't bring their problems to the book. Yes, I, and I think it was uh, also the reluctance of, of older people to accept his theories. They'd much rather dismiss it as, and I've heard the term that Marshall was a charlatan, that uh, he was nuts. But it was because they were, they were unwilling to think about the things that he was saying and to make the connections. What is it? Mental torpitude? Torpitude? Well, he said. <laughs> his main interest was getting on to his work onto his discoveries, to have to take time out to go someplace to lecture, he found quite a great annoyance. 
And yet he'd do it because he felt somewhat of an obligation if they wanted him there. And uh, he, uh, he never wrote his lectures. Oh, he had little, little cards he'd put notes on. But he never wrote his lectures. And, of course, the lecture he gave would often not uh, have any relevance to the notes because he'd hit one point and the feedback would start coming and that would get it started in all sorts of other directions. Now, I remember one occasion uh, in particular where the university, uh, where he'd just spoken, uh, wanted a copy of his speech. He couldn't remember what he'd said, so he sat down and wrote an entirely different speech. Uh, it's not like the, the boy I, I once, when I was in college, I heard of, who was so afraid that he wouldn't pass his exams that he wrote all the answers on his cuffs, on his hand, on his arm. And of course, during the exam, he couldn't remember, or cards in here, he couldn't remember where the answers were, and he fell flat on his face. <laughs> At one point, uh, Marsha was on the Roy and Martin show, and they coined the phrase, what are you doing, Marsha McLuhan? And it was widely uh, quoted, and the children in the park uh, would greet him with, how you doing, Marsha McLuhan? Uh, and friends on the streets would greet him that way. And that went on for quite a long while. And when uh, Roy and Martin were in town at one time, it was Martin, I believe, who asked to meet him and came over to the center, and they had a talk. Well, so many people came over to the center. Lennon and Yoko Ono came, phoned and came over one Saturday morning, uh, which was quite memorable. Uh, and we phoned two or three friends, particularly our youngest son, who was just in ecstasy meeting Lennon, and Lennon was very generous, signing uh, records for them and material. Oh, a lot of people came to the center. Can you tell us a bit about the Trudeau relationship with... Uh, with well, I, I think, I think I'm right about this too. It was when we were in, at Fordham, uh, and Marsha got a call from Trudeau's secretary, or Trudeau, asking Marshall to come back to Toronto, saying that he wanted to confer with him uh, about his, uh, his activities uh, when he became prime minister. So that was the initial. I didn't meet Trudeau at that time. And Marshall made a special trip back to uh, meet Trudeau and talk to him, advise him. And incidentally, at one point, this was much later, uh, Trudeau was laughing to me. Uh, Marshall advised him to grow a beard, a mustache, to improve his public image. He wouldn't be so barefaced bef before the public. Uh, after that initial meeting, uh, Trudeau got in touch with him a number of times. Uh, as a matter of fact, I encountered Trudeau at a hotel one night, unexpectedly. I was going upstairs to dinner with a friend, and Trudeau was just uh, checking in and turned and recognized me. Uh, and I asked his permission to uh, reprint a letter he had written me at Marshall's death uh, to end the volume of Marshall McLuhan's letters that uh, uh, my agent and I were busy compiling. And he very graciously said he'd f be honored to have it. And I said, by the way, I have a big file of your letters uh, and he said, well, I have a big file of Marshall's letters to me, too. <laughs> the question has arisen, how did Marshall view what he was doing? And I could say he didn't. <laughs> he was so busy doing, he never thought of the impact uh, that his work was having on people. It was just his very, very curious mind that he had to satisfy. And of course he wanted, he wanted to enlarge other people's minds, although he never said that. He was not an egotistical person at all. Uh, 
as he often said, he had no point of view. He had no point of view about what he was doing. Just did what came natural, so to speak. And that's one thing, while I'm on the subject, that's one thing people could never understand, that he had no point of view. It was always, what it, does he think about this? What does he think? Is it right? Is it wrong? And they wouldn't believe him when he said, I I'm just presenting the facts. I don't have any point of view. Oh, let's see now. What was that uh, quote of his? I may be wrong, but I'm never in doubt, was a favorite quote of his. <laughs>